everything was flying along and suddenly in the same direction this stuff was flying at about 8,000 miles an hour the object came into the frame shot a, a beam of light at the warhead flew up to the top shot another beam of light at the warhead flew around the direction it was flying shot another beam of light at the warhead flew down shoot another bo bo beam of light at the warhead and flew out the same way it came in Uh, the missile had gone down. My job as a targeting officer was to bring him back up. And so I went into... So you the... didn't see the incident. You just went to the missile. I went to the incident. I went to the uh, site. Where is Maelstrom? It's Great Falls, Montana. Just outside of Great Falls, Montana. What did you make of the story? Well, I know that uh, it's true. I went into job control after I got to the hangar. I was called in, went to the hangar, went to the job control, and I noticed they have a map of the whole complex. The green lights where the missiles were good, but there's one small area with 10 red lights. I mean, those missiles were out. Is it possible they just malfunctioned? That energy, light, is an internal factor in living things. It is not conferred. It is innate. It is part of the structure of these things themselves, and all living forms live off of their own internal energies. These energies are usually uh, moderately distributed. They come as are needed. There is energy behind the blade of grass, but this blade of grass does not directly lead to any tragedy. It has been directed by inward laws in the use of its energy factor. Everything is using energy in some form, whether it be for personal life or collective social existence. Energy is the great mover of things, both qualitative and quantitative. And uh, we must sometimes face the challenge of what to do with it, how to use it, how to prevent it becoming a means of complete destruction for everything we value in life. Now, if we are confronted with a problem such as nuclear fission, we are also problemed with a tremendous need for self-discipline. The individual must recognize that with every opportunity to improve living conditions, he must face the responsibilities inherent in those opportunities. He must realize beyond doubt that the more power he has, the wiser and more virtuous he must become. As long as selfishness, arrogance, violence is associated or are associated with nuclear fission, we are going to be in desperate danger. In other words, we have now made a discovery that can be only handled if we grow up as living things and become responsible, intelligent, constructive, and conscientious in the use of the resources that we have developed. Otherwise, these resources are going to turn on us with frightful consequences. It's probable that Therefore, that the development of the nuclear energy field is not only most closely involved in our ethics, but without proper internal maturity, we are going to be in very dangerous situations. Now, this brings the other side of the coin into focus, with something to do with internal disciplines. And uh, here we... Think in terms of Zen for a moment. Zen is an extraordinary Eastern philosophy. It is built primarily upon Buddhism. It is also, however, deeply involved in the cosmological and anthropological philosophies of the ancients. Zen is a method of controlling atomic energy inside of ourselves. We are constantly calling upon nuclear fission for existence. 
but it is done in a very slow, gentle, and non-belligerent way. We release energy according to the disciplines which are imposed upon physical structure. If we release energy too rapidly, we are desperately ill. If we do not re release it rapidly enough, we are languid and inadequate. Also, however, we realize that energy is constantly operating in our conduct. For one thing, for example, if we overdo or overtax and use more energy than we are able to supply or provide, we are not well. If we waste energy, we are also sick. So Zen has been set up as a discipline of character. We have never previously associated it with nuclear fission. But there is something about it that reminds us of the tremendous energy factor not only behind matter, but behind consciousness and intelligence. There is a mysterious illumination process which is more or less similar to the fission of an atom. There is a tremendous power of spiritual energy locked within the psychic atom of man. This energy he has never learned to use properly or correct correctly, except possibly for a very few great teachers of past ages. The development of man's consciousness resource, like the development of his energy resources, uh, this uh, resource has been exploited, misunderstood, and profaned. Man's consciousness was given to him for a reason, and that reason was not conspiracy. It, he was not made to be a thinking creature in order to outwit his neighbor. He was not created with faculties to understand and comprehend, and then bind them entirely to the profit system. Man internally is misusing his resources, and this in turn has a direct effect upon his health. Now if we take the individual and kind of look him over, in terms not only of philosophy but of science for that matter, we discover that each person is a cosmos in himself. There are probably as many living entities within each human body as there are creatures living upon the earth billions of minute living things cooperate to make the common function of man possible. These minute things become divided, so to say, into races, nationalities. They are given locations, continents. They are nourished. They have their own system of growth and reproduction. They are also able uh, to cooperate in some strange a probably psychic way with all of the needs and problems of the body in which they are involved. Possibly, we do not know, possibly to these little tiny microscopic entities, uh, man as a composite being might be regarded as a god. Maybe he is the great overbeing that is expected to control wisely and lovingly this vast habitation of creatures, which he calls his body. Here he has a tremendous responsibility, because he is capable in almost any phase of his existence of forgetting his duties and allowing his body to suffer as a result. If this, is de if this deity, which we call human spirit, is a just and proper overlord, it will protect the body. But if it is subject to evil habits, if it becomes involved in narcotics or alcoholism, the body as a whole is under a tyranny, a tyranny, a despotism, an anarchy of the ambitions of a person paid for by the destruction of millions of lives which have been given to him to assist in the functions of correct conduct. But the deity, of course, was really part of the soul atom. It was part of the tremendous power in the soul to become the Redeemer. Because the soul atom, or energy, being the highest, 
was able to control the rest if it was properly used. If it was properly understood, properly uh, recognized, and the individual called upon it in his hour of trouble. Therefore, religion becomes, again, another great nuclear entity. It becomes a tremendous vital force. And uh, in our case, the splitting of the religious atom has caused the same kind of tragedy that we fear from the physical atom. The moment religion was broken up into a mass of creeds, its constructive value was largely decimated. And for a long time, this destructiveness was not especially noticeable because religions were local. They belonged to races and nations and cities. But when the world power began to develop and, and religions began to be part of a great world picture, the conflicts between them became very dangerous to the survival of the human being. If we split the religious atom, so to say, and be recognize or believe that religion is a mass of different realities, we are in trouble, for there is only one reality. And the reality in this case, the tremendous energy of the union of religious parts into one, one tremendous totality, we call God. This is the infinite energy that rules and governs all things. If we break it up and say, my God and your God, we are in difficulties. Wherever we break up, we are in trouble. What we must try to do is to grow up to the totality of it. We must try in one way or another to put together the parts of ourselves. We cannot say this is the right leg and this is the left. We have to recognize that they are equally important and are both part of one body. All division is within bodies, but the, the body as a principle is never divided. All religions exist within one religion, and that one religion is never divided. All of the divisions, all of the separations, all of the conflicts and confusions are, are due to that little thing we call the mind. That this atom has taken over. So in Zen, we go back again to this same point, that by being calm and quiet, by being dedicated, we gradually discipline ourselves away from the causes of our troubles. In Zen, for example, we escape the pressure of worldliness. We are not any longer ambitious for public office. We are not ambitious for wealth. We are not ambitious for recognitions. We are not self-centered or vain. We live, in, in a sense, as naturally as possible, and all the energies that we have are devoted to services and good works. We try to use the power we have as it should be for the greater good of the greater number. The life in us is dedicated to the needs of others because all we can do for them also is to help them to release the life that is within themselves. So the great, el the great atom is in all of us. A most tremendous and wonderful experience it comes through the gradual recognition of the tremendous integrity that is locked within each of us. It is behind the criminal, it is behind the person who is today without morality. It is behind the rich and the poor the great and the humble. And in all cases, it is this tremendous blazing star or spark which is life, which brings us into a partnership with all that lives. For regardless of our race or our estate, the spark in us is the same. In some cases, the energy of this spark has been more developed than in others. Some have given greater areas for its manifestation. Some have, for instance, taken on learning in order that that flame in us might shine brightly in some branch of human society. But whatever we do, whether we settle down to being a good carpenter or whether we try to become a priest or become an educator, only thing we are really doing is releasing a part of this 
energy atom in ourselves. We are releasing it into manifestation. We are empowering a virtue. Now, we might have been very willing and desirous of empowering it before, but we had not trained the instrument for its manifestation. Whatever we want to do to release this power from within ourselves, we have to have something to offer. In this old story of the tabernacle in the wilderness, uh, the offerings were brought to the altar of the temple or the tabernacle. Each brought a gift offering. Each brought something. And the, the most acceptable offering, of course, was the animal nature of the individual himself. There were labors of purification where the individual gradually overcame his own selfishness and all these physical limitations. And at last, purified of all dross, he was permitted to enter into the holy place. But this is, of course, this is exactly the way it is in life. We have to bring our offerings to this energy. The individual says, I want to do something, but I don't know what to do. Well, that, the idea is good, but the motivations are inadequate. An individual says, I want to do, I want to do good. I think people should have better homes. I'll help them build them. So I'll study carpentry. And when we become a good carpenter, then that ray of our inner soul atom vitalizes that ability and we become servants of truth. For always we are serving the atom that is truth. And the tremendous energy center, the great spiritual atom which we call the universe, is always dedicated to good. And that which serves good gains universal citizenship. While we are tied up in our own little personal belongings and beliefs and feelings, we are private citizens. But when we begin to serve the larger causes, we are citizens of the world. And uh, with this energy factor developing as it is, we probably will have to become aware every day of the application of certain symbolism to the new forces, new energies, and new resources that we are developing. But with ever, all of it, we have to realize that we are never able to get away from the divine purpose. No matter what we learn, no matter how much we know, or how strong we become, all rests finally with the integrities which are established in nature. When we keep the rules, we are, we are wise and good. And as we keep the rules, we discover that doing the things that are necessary are the greatest joy. And all other things become secondary. This is again a way in which we approach the problem of Zen. For in Zen quietude and self-discipline, we have reached that condition in which we permit no attitude to interfere with realities. Now this sounds as though it might be frustrating, but it is not. Because the realities are more beautiful, more wonderful, and more valuable than any false interpretation we can place upon them. It is tremendously important, above all things, to have inner peace. And until the world has inner peace, the struggles of humanity will never cease. We will never be able to uh, fulfill our proper destiny until the inner life is at rest, because it is firmly established in truths that are eternal. Until we have these firm, firm establishments, all of our outer affairs cannot be properly brought into proper relationships. So out of all this study of atoms and so forth, we are probably going to develop a new philosophy, a philosophy of the realization that the potential of the human being is infinite, that the unfoldment of life is eternal, that all that is necessary is always available. But between them, that which is available and that which we use is the barrier of our own ignorance. Therefore, we should be spending as much time as we can preparing ourselves for a larger destiny than we have ever known. Not a destiny of honors and wealth and distinctions, but a destiny of inner realizations, the gradual and ultimate realization 
of our place in the divine plan of things. And we also will gradually come to know, as a result of this, that there is no easy quietude beyond. We're not going to do very much harp playing. We're not going to float around on flowery beds of ease, as excited in the old hymns. We are going to find that the further we go, the more we will come under the tyranny of infinite power. We will realize that we are constantly required to, to manifest the divine purpose. That wherever we are, we are going to be working to protect the flow of this divine atom in ourselves. That we are going to find more and more ways of using it. We are also going to find that it is our ever-present help in time of trouble. Finally, this mysterious atom in ourselves becomes obviously the real self and contains within itself the, the possibility, the potential of every value existing in nature. That little spark of divine life in us locks within itself a cosmos as vast as any universe we can imagine. There is no end to the unfoldment of life, but all of this unfoldment is toward the final justification of existence until someday, in spite of the scientific opinions to the contrary, we are going to find that the universe is a happy place, that it is a place of fulfillments and not of frustrations, and that we are all privileged to grow along with each other toward this goal. And that when we understand this growth, the happiness begins with the understanding. We don't have to wait for the growing. Everything that we believe and want can be fulfilled. There can be nice homes. There can be happy children. There can be busy people doing interesting things. There can be self-expression, developments in arts and ethics. There can be all kinds of wonderful experiences as we go along. The moment we change the point of view and get away from this constant sense of separateness, which is the split atom, and realize actually that these separatenesses all fall together to make one, and that in the fullness of time, the fullness of realities, uh, we can earn anything we want, anything we need, and that actually Zen tells us this. It says you can have anything you want for one very simple reason. You won't want anything. <laughs> I think with those kind words, we better stop. <laughs>